I was uh, getting my mics on during the beginning of that video, and I, so I wasn't really paying attention to what he was saying at first, but suddenly I look at the screen and there's people in cupcakes <laughs> driving down the street. And I thought, yeah, that's what we need. We need laughter. <laughs> so a number of years ago, my brother came over to my house. I was, I was living in southern Alberta at the time. My brother came over to my house with um, colorful craft material and signs and like plastic, you know, just sheets of plastic. And he said, I have this great idea. I want to think up some sayings, make some signs, and then walk around during rush hour with them. And I thought, yeah, let's do that. So we made some signs. We, uh, the next day, we took these signs that we'd made in my living room and, and walked around downtown during rush hour. Now, here in the liberal city of Nelson, British Columbia, this may not seem like a very strange idea. <laughs> in fact, I have seen people with signs on Baker Street. I've had great conversations with people who are carrying signs on Baker Street. Uh, in Nelson, I've seen a whole lot more unique manifestations of diversity and, and expression. Um, and I've also seen people carrying signs. Now, in conservative southern Alberta at the time, or however, <laughs> that's not quite as common. <laughs> so we walked around that day, and on, on one side of my sign, it said, just another distraction. So just another distraction is what I was walking around, all of those people in their cars trying to get home after work, bottlenecking on the way over the bridge, trying to get away into the suburbs. I walked around thinking about distractions. And there seem to be so many distractions that we absorb as we live and as we learn, as we go through our lives. Um, we, have, we have our governments telling us what to think. We have advertisements telling us what to buy, what to purchase, what we need for our lives. We have, we have our school systems telling us how to think and how to learn. We have all of these distractions. Now, we have our cultural system. What is required in a culture and in a society is to, to agree on some way of, of recognizing that we need, we need a way to engage with the world. So, for example, if I were to um, drive up to a red light, I know that it means I need to stop. And that kind of rule is something that we agree on. We have, it's a law. We have laws enforcing it. We have to get our driver's license to agree, to really take the step to say, yes, I'm going to stop at a red light. And these kinds of things, they benefit us in our culture. We also have these kind of unwritten ideas that simply exist. For example, a female walking around with books in school would be more likely to hold them in the crook of her arm. And a male would be possibly more likely to hold them at his side as he walked. So that kind of cultural norm or idea, it doesn't necessarily benefit us, but it's a way in which we, we kind of interact with the world. Um, and we do, we need a system, we need a way to, to, we need something that we can all agree on as a way to understand ourselves and understand our place in this world. But what happens when that understanding causes us to be distracted from what is real and from what comes from a more deeper place of truth? Um, it's often that we are given these layers and given these ideas that take away from the clarity that comes within ourselves. Uh, Michel Foucault was a 20th century philosopher and social theorist. And he took the idea of Jeremy Bentham's panopticon. And what that is, is a round prison, a circular prison, with the guard tower in the middle and the cells on the outside. And his idea was that there would be a window between the cell and the guard so that the guards would be able to see in all cells at any time that they wanted, but the prisoners on the outside wouldn't know when they were being watched. And Michel Foucault took this idea and applied it to our modern society and said, 
That's what we're doing to ourselves. We are in these cells, not knowing when we're being watched. So in that way, we self-regulate our behavior. We, we behave in these ways, these ascribed ways that these systems, our education, our peer groups, our government, tells us how to behave in, these, in this self-made, self-made, self-regulated way, we take those ideas and then put ourselves into that prison. So questioning those self-made prisons is how we create a, li- a life for ourselves that actually does have meaning. Looking in depth at, at these layers of identity gives us the choice to say, do I really want to adopt that way of of engaging in the world? Do I really want to take on that layer? Or do I want to do something different? Do I want to look inward and see what I really think? Do I want to take the time to notice around me all of these ways that I'm being told how to think and how to be? Or do I want to stop and get clarity on myself and on my life? So what youth need to thrive is clarity. Now, as youth, we have this amazing tool of time on our sides. We're not, we haven't been deeply entrenched into our patterns and habits for decades upon decades of our adult lives. Our brain synapses haven't fired deep troughs into these habits. (laughs) We have the opportunity to step outside, to try something new, to try something different. We have the time. Um, As part of my yoga philosophy training, I took on a a year project. And my my topic was the illusion of time. So I spent a lot of time engaging with thoughts on time. And what came out of that for me was seeing it as a tool, (laughs) seeing it as this opportunity that I have to really create a life that I want for myself. So what we need to do is listen to ourselves, to to ask ourselves questions. What does it mean for me to thrive? What gives my life meaning? I don't have some broad answer or broad statement of, okay, yes, this is a successful life for everyone. But I can say that every individual can look inside themselves and find out what that answer would be for them. And sometimes finding that clarity in the midst of these illusions can be a daunting task. We're not always given the tools, we're not always given the means in order to to do so, in order to step back away from these externalized systems and look inward and see how we truly want to engage with the world. But what I do have, what we all have, is we have ourselves. So I know that if I just stand back, what do I have? I am here. My heart is beating. I'm breathing. I know that I have that. I know that I have that opportunity to connect back in with myself. I know that I have that center and that core, which is often often a forgotten element as I navigate through life with these bombardments of other systems, other ways of being. Now, the other side of that sign that I carried that day said, immortal spiritual being. I was calling attention to the fact that we all have that within us, that center and that core that is timeless that is a place that we can go to, to reconnect with that still small voice within that has all of the answers, that that has the clarity in which we seek. And how is it that we can get back to that? It can be as simple as coming back to the breath. The breath is this amazing tool that we, we do carry with us all of the time. It's always with us. So I invite us all now to take a moment and 
reconnect with our breath. So if you'd like, you can find a comfortable seating or standing position. You can elongate up through your spine, creating space in your body, space for your breath. If you'd like, you can close your eyes and bring your attention to the space between your eyebrows. You can have your palms facing up in a receptive position. And relax your body. Relax your shoulders, your neck, your face. And notice your breath. Notice your inhales and your exhales. Bring your breath to an even rhythm. Inhaling to the count of three or four. And exhaling to the count of three or four. Sitting relaxed in your body and mind, allowing your breath to flow through your being. And then beginning to deepen your breath, and bring movement back into your body. You can wiggle your fingers and your toes, and gently opening your eyes. in the openness and receptivity that coming back to center allows, we can answer these questions in an honest and pure way. What does it mean for me to thrive? What would that look like in my own life? We all have the opportunity to take away, take away the time and ask ourselves those questions and answer them for ourselves, living a life that you find with clarity is a thriving life for you. And then having the courage to go and take action, take those steps to live that life. Thank you very much.